The King of Iron Fist Tournament Tekken The most popular 3D fighting game franchise in history, and neck and neck with Street Fighter when it comes to sales. While there's other fighting games that are better sellers, including Mortal Kombat and of course Smash Brothers, Tekken has reigned supreme in the 3D fighting space, leaving all of its competitors in the dust. It was a cultural phenomenon that is still going strong today, with Tekken 8 being the latest release. Its history dates all the way back to 1994 with the release of the original Tekken, at a time where the idea of 3D fighting games felt like the bleeding edge of technology. And arguably, it spawned a mile-long list of imitators as every developer wanted to compete and cash in on the 3D fighting game craze. But many changes were implemented over time. Some steps forward, some steps back, as the franchise found its footing and defined its identity and took its place at the top. And I'm going to look back and chronologically revisit the entire franchise in depth and break down its place in time, the changes they made, the characters they introduced, and what exactly is the obsession this series has with volcanoes. There's also going to be some extra surprises along the way, and this is going to be a very long video, so you have timestamps below for everything. So hi, I'm Mug Thief. sit back, relax, and join me on a journey through the history of Tekken. The story of Tekken begins not with Namco, which are the developers and publishers, but instead with the advances in technology and the release of Sega's Model 1 arcade platform, developed by AM2. Back in the 90s, it's hard to explain how big a leap forward it was. If you compare games like Mortal Kombat 2 and Samurai Showdown, and in the 3D realm games like Star Fox, to what Sega's platform could put out in arcades, it was a real head-turner. Today, we look back at those primitive 3D graphics as a pretty poor-looking stepping stone to the future, and actually remember many of the 2D-based games as works of art, with things like Rondo of Blood having released that same year. But for the time, these 3D graphics were something that had never been seen or done before. Sega's Model 2, while still an initial outing, put out Virtua Racing and then Virtua Fighter. And people took notice. Most relevant to our story though, Namco saw the growing popularity of Virtua Fighter as a way to break into fighting games, without the need to compete with the giants that already existed in arcades like Street Fighter 2, Mortal Kombat, and the SNK franchises. Instead, by jumping into this unexplored space, they had to compete with only Virtua Fighter, and so began development on Tekken. Now, it's not true that Tekken was always seen as a competitor to Virtua Fighter. It was originally an internal test for 3D models, utilizing Namco's technology that was competing at the time with Sega, and the same technology behind Ridge Racer. Racing games and fighting games really were huge in arcades back then, and that did translate to home consoles, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The development of Tekken really took off when Seiichi Ishii, a designer on Virtua Fighter, joined Namco and began working on the internal project, leading to what he saw as an evolution of his work on Virtua Fighter, now moved to the Namco System 11 arcade hardware. Tekken was meant to be more detailed, with textures applied to the 3D models and switched from Virtua Fighter's two buttons plus a block button system to a four button scheme, mapping each button to one of the limbs, a decision that remains to this day. And so it was done. Tekken would release in arcades in 1994. Now, I don't want to go too in depth on the story of Tekken, since there's amazing videos that already do that. But I do want to talk about some of the highlights to at least give context to some of this insanity so I'm gonna go a little in-depth. The story of Tekken starts with Heihachi Mishima, leader of the Mishima Zaibatsu Company, who throws his son Kazuya off a cliff when he's five years old in order to test his strength. This will be a recurring theme in the franchise, don't you worry. The fall activates the devil gene in Kazuya, which gives him devil powers. Kazuya goes on to travel the world competing in martial arts as one does after being thrown off a cliff, and after 21 years, Heihachi hosts his own tournament called The King of the Iron Fist. Kazuya faces off against the roster of Tekken 1, as well as some others including Li Chaolan, 
which is a Chinese boy adopted by Heihachi to motivate Kazuya with competition. Normal dad stuff. And while the main story is crazy, let's stop a minute to look at some of the other competitors. King is a wrestler who grew up as an orphan brawling in the streets, but he was saved by priests, so he renounced violence and became one as well. He then obsessed over protecting an orphanage, but to make money, he put on a jaguar mask and began wrestling, gaining fame as the Beast Priest. He wrestled and made a rival in Armor King, another jaguar mask wearing wrestler, and then he entered the King of the Iron Fist to make money. Nina Williams is an Irish assassin who, I kid you not, works for the IRA and is hired to assassinate Heihachi during the tournament and Kazuya in Tekken 2. But also she has a sister, Anna Williams, with whom she has a long-standing feud over the death of their father. And Anna is hired as the bodyguard of the people Nina is hired to assassinate. And this will also be a recurring theme. Paul Phoenix is the Ryu type. He's an American biker and martial artist but he's obsessed with becoming the best in the world, and Kazuya stands in his way. Also, he constantly defeats Kuma, who is a bear. Yes, Kuma, the bear, is Heihachi's pet, and Heihachi taught him martial arts, and he also enters the tournament. However, because he's a bear, his hibernation and general sleep schedule ruin his discipline and martial arts prowess. However, I really can't stress this enough, very logically, since he's a bear, he doesn't think humans can beat him until Paul does, and then he forms a very one-sided rivalry with him. Jack is a Mishima Zaibatsu robot thing, and there are like thousands of them, but they are in the game to stop Kazuya. Yoshimitsu is… Uh, oh man, yeah, Yoshimitsu are actually a long line of people who inherit the title and name as leaders of the Manji clan, always in secret so that they appear immortal. As far as we know, this has been happening since, like, forever. Since this is canon with Soul Calibur, which takes place in the 13th century, he enters as a distraction for his clan to steal the money. But he gets wrapped up in the tournament when he discovers Ganryu, a disgraced sumo wrestler with bad ring manners hired by Heihachi, and that makes him very angry. Martial Law is the Bruce Lee stand-in that was obligatory at the time for fighting games. He's friends with Paul and wants money, but he is defeated by Wang Jinrei, which is a close friend of Heihachi's dad, Jinpachi, and he'll show up in a good long while. Michelle Chang is a Chinese Native American who possesses a mystical pendant with hidden power. This pendant and her daughter will be important in a while as well. And that pendant is the reason that Kunimitsu enters the tournament. She's a former member of the Manji clan, that's Yoshimitsu's clan, and she wants to steal it. We won't talk about Kunimitsu again until about like two hours from now. So those are all the characters in Tekken 1. The main eight were in the arcade and you fought those other characters which are clones of the main eight, meaning that they play exactly the same, just, you know, a palette swap. When Tekken arrived to the PlayStation in 1995, all of them would become playable, unlocked by beating arcade mode with each of the eight main playable characters, along with Heihachi, who serves as the boss of the game and a special costume for Kazuya, where he looks like he's the devil. Heihachi is unlocked by beating the game without continues with whatever character you like. And so, the stage of history is set. Tekken's console release would be a big hit, reaching over a million sales and generally leading to great success. It was impressive to play a game that looked like this at home, although what you're seeing is a very improved emulation as to not make it too harsh on modern screens. It was also a perfect fit for Sony's PlayStation, thanks to the four face buttons, as stated retrospectively by Harada, known today as the big figurehead of everything Tekken. And so let's play Tekken 1. And unfortunately, Tekken 1 might have looked great for the time, but it's also not very fun. To start off, let's talk about Tekken's control scheme, which many 3D fighters would share around this time. Aside from the four-button system, commands in 3D fighters are very different than what we normally see in 2D fighters. While the school of Street Fighter 2 brought commands like the quarter circle and the dragon punch motions, 3D fighters rely much more on button combinations and sequences. Tekken notation, or how you write out the moves, follows things like saying down forward 2 or DF2, which means pressing down forward and two, which is right punch, all at once. This repeats with things like DB34, meaning down, back, and both kicks at the same time. 
There are still more traditional inputs and pretty much any motion you can see elsewhere eventually shows up in Tekken, but it also has inputs like electrics and hell sweeps, two very iconic moves for the Mishima clan and fighters that fit into that style, being forward, neutral, down, and down forward, and then punch your kick. Sounds complicated, really isn't. The other big part of it are sequences, and these can be a pain. Even compared to other fighters of the time, many combos and moves in Tekken rely on pressing a series of buttons one after the other, and that's normal, but the timing here in Tekken 1 is very strict. You have to end up mashing buttons as fast as possible to get the strings to come out, and I had to play Tekken with a weird claw grip to get my thumb into better position to make it easier and more reliable. But most importantly, Tekken is stiff. It feels unresponsive, not because it actually is, but because there's a lag and awkwardness baked into the way it plays. For starters, while it does a decent job at making each character distinct, there is a certain feeling that they're all quite similar. Once you dig into movesets, you can see more of that personality come out, but they're all fairly basic. All of your moves have a long delay. The recovery time after pressing a button until pressing another button is long, making things feel like they go in a rigid slow motion. Blocking still more or less works after moves, which you do by holding back, but this issue of laggy moves feels even worse when you're going for a combo and don't press the inputs fast enough, making you look like an idiot slowly jabbing at the air in intervals. It's also worth noting that the 3D part of a 3D fighting game doesn't really exist yet. I mean, the game is 3D graphically, but there's no sidestepping and no rolling, so in gameplay, it stays on a 2D plane. It can sometimes feel like a turn-based game and not in the fighting game turn-based meaning, and since I want to be thorough in my reviews of all of these games, I played Tekken for 4 hours straight. I learned movesets, learned inputs, and beat the game 5 times before dropping the difficulty to easy, setting the rounds to 1, and fully beating it for all the unlockable characters. It was intensely frustrating. The combination of having played better games and knowing how basic this is really added to the fire. I can imagine, with a lot of effort, how people found Tekken fun and novel at the time, but it is not a game I recommend going back to. Its options are bare bones, limited to arcade and versus, and nothing more. There's no reset option, no move lists in game, and you need a manual for the move lists. There's no training either, so you have to get good fighting the arcade mode, and these are some astonishingly cheap ass computers, I swear. Now this was standard for the time, and you have to remember that these are arcade games making their way to consoles. It was already incentive enough that you had your arcade favorite at home and you could play it without paying up for each continue or to play with your friends. So this was still an appealing product at the time, but the AI remained the monsters of quarter gobbling that they were programmed to be in arcades. To an almost comical degree, the computer opponents will read your inputs and react to them perfectly. It feels like as you progress, they can dial up or down how stupid this can get depending on if they are winning or losing. You can feel how pressing a high attack leads to them instantly ducking the attack, or how they robotically micro-position at the ideal range. If you ever preemptively block, they will grab you a frame, I'm not kidding, I watched the footage back, a frame later. This means that you're not only playing a stiff, old, basic 3D fighting game, but you're not really playing it how it's meant to be played. You're figuring out how to use what you have to outsmart a computer, and that isn't very fun. Even after an extended amount of time playing, it felt like I was forced to find ways to cheat with characters in order to win. And while that did lead me to learning movesets and muscle memory that would accompany me throughout my entire journey, I was enjoying the experience in spite of the game, and not because of it. And while graphically we can talk about how it looked for the time, aesthetically it did a lot of different things. The arcade version does look really good, but even then, the aesthetic is iconic and does actually contain a lot of character. I mean, look at Heihachi and King, they were always going to be big hits. And finally, its music, at least to me, is pretty okay. It's not something I would write home about, which would change a lot over time. And at the conclusion of Tekken's story, Kazuya wins the tournament and throws Heihachi down the same cliff that he threw him down so many years ago. 
also this creepy smile. And so concludes a very important part of history, but not really a game worth playing today beyond curiosity. But just as Tom Holland said in that one movie, greatness from small beginnings. Tekken and Virtua Fighter were really prototypes for the direction the genre would take, and as Tekken released to success on home consoles, the interest from other developers to hop into the space would grow in that exciting way afforded by the technology of the time, where we didn't need six years to make a game and where everybody could rush out and try out their own ideas. And so I think it's fair to not only talk about Tekken, because many of its most influential decisions and changes don't take place in a vacuum and I think that truly evaluating it requires a bit of context. So surprise, this video is way bigger than you thought and that I thought as well. So yeah, let's talk about Virtua Fighter 2. What I played is the Sega Saturn port, but it released earlier both in arcades and at home than Tekken 2. And while we'll soon see that comparing it to Tekken 2 has more meat to that debate, there is absolutely no comparison to Tekken 1. Virtual Fighter 2 retains the punch, kick, and block system of Virtual Fighter, but it's leaps and bounds ahead of anything else at the time. The game feels responsive, the timing on combos is more generous, the slight juggles that can happen are satisfying, movesets are varied with different animations for each character, and the overall quality of both graphics and gameplay are still pretty good today. It even had ringouts, just as Virtual Fighter 1, but they look even more impressive with the graphic overhaul of Virtual Fighter 2. Its roster is fairly limited, but all of its characters are very unique, much more than Tekken, which had that sameness I mentioned. If Tekken could blow your mind, Virtual Fighter 2 would shatter your reality. Virtual Fighter was pretty big in Japan, but Sega really wanted to push it into the West, and it wasn't finding success. It didn't help that the game was stuck on the Sega Saturn, a console that infamously didn't do very well, especially compared to the PlayStation 1, heavily limiting its exposure. It's fun to think about how things would be today if Virtua Fighter had released on PlayStation, or if Sega hadn't gone the way it did, because Virtua Fighter 2 by all accounts is a substantially better game than any Tekken would be for a while still. Sega also thought one of the reasons that Virtual Fighter 2 wasn't finding success against Tekken was its more tame roster and personality, being kind of vanilla flavored, without all the wacky stuff you could see in Tekken. So AM2 would then make Fighting Vipers, which is in the same engine and the same quality as Virtual Fighter 2, but with wacky characters that are cool for the 90s. I mean, look at this. Look at Raxel or Rachel, I don't know. That's some 90s energy right there. Sandman? Look at him. He bowls you. How can you not love a character that his throw is he does bowling with you? Like, come on. It brings in a lot of stuff, though. Firstly, Fighting Vipers has walls. Every match is a cage match, and all the characters have armor, which after taking repeated damage to either the top or bottom, can break, and then they take extra damage. The walls can also break, allowing for ringouts, and it features a universal hyper armor move, meaning it can absorb hits, but it can be blocked, grabbed, or if the other player starts their own hyper armor move, the one that started the latest wins. And it does a lot of armor damage and wall damage, and also you can jump onto walls and jump off them, which I thought was something that only happened in Sonic the Fighters, which is the Sonic fighting game, which was also made by AM2. So there you go, there's some extra trivia. It's crazy, but fun. It's loud and colorful and definitely has character. It's not great character, though. It's kind of cringe in a way that Tekken isn't. I don't know how this was viewed back then, but I know that Tekken's cringe is kind of timeless, since many characters are the same today, but this, this isn't. It's a decent fighting game, and one rarely spoken about, and a valiant attempt to combat Tekken. It also has Jojo in it, I mean Bon, and Bon does indeed stand out. I needed to make that joke, I'm sorry. Also, it's worth mentioning that both Virtual Fighter 2 and Fighting Vipers have some really groovy tunes. Especially Fighting Vipers has got a really funky style to it. I mean, obviously, Virtual Fighter 2 has some classics in the soundtrack department, but Fighting Vipers uh, pulls its own weight in its own style as well, so... Hey, good job, Sega. But the quality of Virtual Fighter 2 doesn't take away the merit of what Tekken 2 did. 
While development times for the arcade versions and ports muddy things a bit, in the Western console perception, Tekken released in November of 1995 on PlayStation. Tekken 2 would release in August of 1996, taking a bit longer to reach Europe. That's eight months to get the sequel. And to be fair, Tekken 2 was only a nine-month wait in Japanese arcades from the first game. And let me tell you this much, Tekken 2 is one of the craziest improvements I've ever seen from a sequel. But let's start off with the biggest change. The roster has now grown to 25 playable characters. Remember that in Tekken 1 we had 8, and even when counting the 17 of the home release, they were all basically costume swaps. While the 25 characters here still share similarities, they all have something that makes them unique and pushes them beyond clones. We'd see the return of all the previous fighters, and their stories would continue along with the new additions. And once again, I do have to cover at least the basics of the story, and I'm sure I will regret this decision when I'm still writing this script two weeks from now, and the video has ballooned to whatever length you know this video is, but I still don't. While we're at it, please like this video. You have no idea how much time and effort went into this, and I'd really hate if it just ended up at like 200 views or something. And liking the video helps it reach more viewers. Okay, so Heihachi climbs up the cliff, the one that Kazuya threw him off of, the same one from when Kazuya was a kid, and he starts training. Meanwhile, Kazuya takes over the Mishima Zaibatsu, and he's so evil because of the devil gene that he's running the corporation like an evil enterprise out of a movie. So everyone hates Kazuya, and to get rid of his haters, he does what all great leaders do, and he hosts a fighting tournament to beat the shit out of everyone, and he baits them in with a prize pool of one trillion dollars with a T. How much money does the company have that he can spend one trillion on this? Anyways, for reasons that you more or less might expect, all of the previous characters join again. Nina has to assassinate Kazuya this time. Anna is his bodyguard. Paul wants to be the best, the best around. And Kuma wants to beat Paul. King is an alcoholic, but Armor King gets him to put on the mask and enter the tournament for the orphans. Ganryu works for Kazuya instead of Heihachi. Wang wants to fulfill Jinpachi's wish of killing Heihachi and Kazuya, which Jinpachi hates because they're evil. Also, that's the entire Tekken franchise. It's just Mishima's hating each other and other people get caught up in it, but whatever. Li Xiaolan is Kazuya's secretary, which is some real Devil Wears Prada energy right there. Yoshimitsu wants to rescue Dr. Baskanovich, which is a thing I skipped from Tekken 1, but Kazuya is using this doctor for experiments, and also Kunimitsu is here after failing to steal Michelle's pendant and wants to steal Yoshimitsu's sword. Speaking of Michelle, she's just kind of here, but she'll be important later. Martial Law enters because newcomer Baek Dusan trashed Law's place and he wants revenge. Also, he wants money. But Baek didn't destroy Law's dojo out of evil. He did it due to uncontrollable rage after accidentally killing his father while sparring. Baek, as a note, is basically Huarang and is indeed Huarang's master. Huarang isn't in this game though, that'll come later. Bruce Irvin is a Muay Thai fighter, so think Sagat from Street Fighter, but his moveset would largely transfer to Brian Fury in a couple of games. Also, he was a police officer who served along Lei Wulong, another new character from Hong Kong who's investigating the Zaibatsu, and they are now on opposing sides. Jack 2 is the sequel to Jack, and this will be kind of the same for every Tekken game, so I won't bring it up again, just assume that there's a new Jack model each game. There's also Alex and Roger, which are a genetically modified dinosaur and kangaroo. These two are palette swaps, but they are both boxers. I refuse to explain more. And finally, the last and most important newcomer, Jun Kazama, a wildlife protection officer sent to arrest Kazuya. Jun and Kazuya are attracted to each other, not physically, but by forces beyond comprehension, and then yeah, also physically. During the tournament, Jun fails to arrest Kazuya, but she's compelled to free him of the dark forces of the devil gene, creating a struggle within Kazuya. Also, they go to Bone Town while this happens. Meanwhile, Paul defeats Heihachi in the semifinals, but he then gets stuck in traffic. I mean, the accident was provoked so he wouldn't make it to the match, but still, what a reason for Paul to once again not win against Kazuya, and Heihachi takes his place. 
Kazuya, due to the struggle within him caused by Jun, can't defeat Heihachi, who after winning, boards a helicopter and throws Kazuya into a volcano, which then erupts. It's like the planet itself is allergic to Kazuya. Jun would disappear and give birth to Jin Kazama, which if you don't know, will be very, very important. Whew, oh boy. Anyways, let's play some Tekken 2. A huge roster and changes to movesets really are a sign of how the series is spreading its wings and finding its footing. The AI in Tekken 2 is equally as bullshit as Tekken 1, but a little less so, and the expanded movesets lead to most characters having some move that is easily spammable for wins. To get a feel for the games, every game in this video I start off playing normally for more or less runs through arcade mode, five runs in the case of Tekken 2, and then I switch the difficulty to easy and the rounds to one in order to beat it and unlock all the characters without making the production of this video my entire life. Right off the bat, Tekken 2 has way better movement, more responsive controls since that ending delay has been shortened and it's more lenient on timings for inputs. Not too much, but a little, making it play faster. It also includes a host of different modes, with time attack, survival, and a decent practice mode. But what I think is the biggest change to how the game feels is the difference with those expanded movesets. Not only does each character feel more unique and not just the clones, but every character, the big thing for me, especially when talking about making the game more popular with the casual audience, are that a lot of the expansions to movesets Start with simply holding down a direction and pressing a button, and that leads to cool looking and easy to perform combos, including things from neutral stance as well, like simply pressing kick three times with bike, but also other simple inputs that are very easy to figure out, like forward kicks and then switching up which kick button or holding down during the string. I think this helps so much in bringing people into the franchise and enjoying fighting, because it's a nice place to start with flashy moves that feel good, where in Tekken 1, if you just try mashing buttons while holding a direction, all of the moves feel fairly average except maybe Kazuya and Law. Even if you have no idea of what moves are for the characters, or if you've yet to discover things like pressing down forward 2, you'll still probably press buttons and have cool shit happen in Tekken 2. We also see how they drill down into the fundamentals that will build the series up. Things like King getting all of his grapple strings extended, or Nina getting more grapples, and more and more iconic moves get brought in. What also becomes clear is the identity of the franchise. This is a flashy game, with big moves that deal a lot of damage. Rounds can be over in two or three well-placed hits, especially counter hits, which are moves that hit the opponent while they're attacking, not to be confused with actual counters or punishing the opponent on block or whiff. It's surprising that rounds really are this short and damage values are something that we will see change over time as the series settles on balance and exactly how long they want rounds to be. Speaking of balance, the exceedingly long time you could spend on the ground is now mitigated with two different things. Mashing triangle allows you to get up faster, and you can now roll on the ground to avoid damage and potentially getting hit while standing up. Both are great things. Now, generally speaking, people consider Tekken 3 to not only be one of the best fighting games ever, but also where Tekken really becomes Tekken. And I disagree. We'll talk about a ton of things that come with Tekken 3, but where Tekken 1 feels like a prototype, an idea for a game with some cool characters, Tekken 2 feels like Tekken. There's a general feeling to the gameplay that, while still stiff, is so much better. The overall aesthetics, the melodramatic flair of Kazuya in his purple suit and then turning into a devil with the infamous stage with the infinite mirror screens contrasted with the goofy stuff like Kuma and the boxing dinosaur. It's all pieces slowly falling into place, and it's a ton of fun. Unlocking everything in Tekken 2 is mostly done by playing through the game, except Roger and Alex, which require beating stage 3 with a grate, which is when you win with very little health left. And when everything is unlocked, what you're left with is a huge package. I can see why going back to it after Tekken 3 might make it feel like it's lackluster in the gameplay department, but for the time, I'm convinced it was the biggest jump we've seen in the franchise, except maybe Tekken 5. 
It improves controls, defines directions, introduces characters, and is honestly a ton of fun. And with Kazuya in the depths of a volcano, it would take one year until we reach that mythical series high point, if not overall peak. Tekken 3 released in March of 97, another short frame of time from Tekken 2. Tekken 3's console release would require a full year into March of 98 for Japan, and April and September for North America and Europe respectively. Heihachi is now the head of the Mishima Zaibatsu again, and he's established the Tekken Force, a private corporate army, and this will be important later. Tekken Force uncovers some ruins in Central America that house the god of fighting, Ogre, which is like a demon that wishes to fight anything and everything that can fight, but longs for the strongest fighters in the world, and Heihachi wants to capture it, I think. After Ogre Awakens, great fighters all over the world start to disappear and or die, including King. Ogre killed King, and I am sad, but it's okay because Tekken 3 is a huge time skip, and we get King 2, which is Armor King's protege. But we also get Jin Kazama, Jun and Kazuya's son, who is instructed by his mother to search for Heihachi if anything happens, and after she's attacked by Ogre, that's what he does. Also, Jun is dead. I'm just kidding. We thought she was dead, but she's back in Tekken 8, so I guess we were just left with suspense for 17 years. Anyways, Heihachi trains Jin in Mishima-style karate, and it becomes pretty clear that Jin has the devil gene. So Heihachi plans to use Jin to lure out Ogre, and he does this by starting up the King of the Iron Fist Tournament 3. Due to the 20-year time skip, Tekken 3 pulls a Street Fighter 3, making most characters new. And now I have to explain so many more things. This is not a comprehensive explanation of the stories, but I hope they are brief enough and entertaining enough. And if I do get anything wrong, let me know in the comments below, and I'll have a pinned comment of corrections. I have like 18 tabs of different wikis, the game manuals, and interviews to write this stuff. But I'm human, and I might make some mistakes, so I'm sorry. Here we go. Brian Fury is a psychotic, ultra-violent Interpol officer with some relation to Lei Wulong, who gets gunned down in Hong Kong, but his body is sent to the evil Dr. Abel, who turns him into a cyborg. He joins the tournament to take down Dr. Baskanovich, Yoshimitsu's friend, and Yoshi takes him down. Eddie Gordo is a capoeira practitioner from a rich family. His father was murdered, and he did the time for it. And once released, he's seeking justice with his awesome prison capoeira. He enters the tournament seeking help or power from the Mishima Financial Empire in order to get justice, except he finds out that his father was murdered by Kazuya. Dun dun dun! That was lame. Why did I do that? Huarang is Baik's student, a South Korean Taekwondo expert. Baik was taken down by Ogre and presumed dead, so he enters to get revenge. He also has a rivalry with Jin, which started up a bit before the tournament, and they have that going for them the entire rest of the series. I actually didn't know this next one, but Forest Law is Martial Law's son, and he's also friends with Paul, and he joins to get money for his dad along with Paul. I just thought that this was Marshall, because Marshall comes back after this, and Forest is relegated to an extra character in spin-offs. I guess they wanted to have this same character, but with a new generation feel, but then they went back on it like, well, Paul is here, so we should just leave Marshall. Julia Chang is Michelle Chang's adopted daughter, and she's into reforestation and stuff. She enters because her mom disappears after looking for Heihachi, so she wants answers, and she is also sometimes a masked wrestler named JC. I have no more comments on that part. Ling Xiaoyu is a Chinese teenager that's a stand-in and disciple of Wang Jinrei, and evolution of that character. She wants to build an amusement park and asks Heihachi for it. And since she's good at martial arts, Heihachi moves her into the Mishima Zaibatsu complex and rolls her into the same school as Jin and promises the amusement park if she wins the tournament. She also receives her companion and bodyguard, Panda, which is a panda that knows Mishima-style karate, much like Kuma. Also, Kuma is dead. It's been 20 years, so Kuma simply died. But now there's Kuma 2, which is the son of Kuma. And Kuma 2 also has a feud with Paul, but he's in love with Panda. Kuma 2. Kuma 2, the son of Kuma, would be 
<laughs> a great title for a movie. Rounding out the cast with secret characters are Ogre, of course, boss character needs to be a secret character, and Dr. Boskanovich, Tiger Jackson, which is a palette swap with Eddie, who has an afro, and Gone. Gone is a dinosaur from a manga. He's in this game. Of course. Anyways, I'm already regretting including the story, so let's play some Tekken 3. And this game marks the start of very expanded console versions. It's not just about characters available, since really at this point arcades and consoles are almost at parity except a character or two. But instead, it's all the extra modes included, which I imagine is at least partially the reason for the longer delay in bringing it to consoles. Not only do they now need to include all the CG cutscenes for story, but also we get things like Tekken Ball also known as the King of the Iron Fist Tournament, Ball. Which is this minigame where you hit a ball and the ball goes to the other side, it's kind of like volleyball, and it can hit the opponent or the ground, and also it's a very good way of unlocking Gone. Uh, Tekken Ball is great. And of course, Tekken Force, a really strange side-scrolling style brawler? It seems to emulate stuff like Streets of Rage and all those beat-em-ups you remember, AVP, X-Men, you know. But in controls with awkward movement as you lock onto characters, and they kind of snap into place as you enter combat mode, which controls just like normal fights. It has four stages, at the end of each a boss, and if you beat it four times, you unlock Dr. Boskanovich. This alongside time attack practice and survival modes, as well as theater mode, which made getting footage for the endings a lot easier. Tekken 3 adds juggling to the core gameplay, along with a different combo system. Except not really and only kind of. This is difficult to explain, but juggling as a concept is the idea of hitting your opponent while they are in the air to keep a combo going. This is, you could do that before, but now it's calculated differently. I had to look up what Tekken 3 actually does just to know if I was losing my mind, and looking it up didn't help. So it did add universal reversals, as far as I can tell, but it simply added more moves that enable juggling. But it doesn't revolutionize the concept. Wikis claim that they added combo throws, but I don't understand this term, and I can't find an explanation of it by googling or on the fighting game term glossary, just nothing. Are these combos that start with a throw? Are they combos that lead into throws? Are they combos that lead to command grabs? Or are they long throw strings? Because all those except the third one were in Tekken 2, so very confused. It also allegedly makes recoveries faster, which yeah, a bit, but not much more than the fast recovery by spamming triangle in Tekken 2, so I'm confused a bit. But even with all of those things maybe not being as true as they sound on paper, Tekken 3 is a huge improvement, if more of an iterative one. All the movesets are now even bigger, meaning that same feeling from 2 where just hitting things will lead to cool looking and feeling stuff, so newcomers don't feel like they can just do basic kick and punch. The demanding timing on moves has been toned down, and you can really feel it this time, and ultimately what Tekken 3 brings is a refinement on gameplay, an expansion of the moves, an upgraded console experience, and graphically, a bright and shiny new game that was for many years the best-selling fighting game in the world. It's Tekken 2, but better. It was a cultural phenomenon. The characters were a hit, the aesthetics were iconic, the music was amazing, and it eclipsed Tekken 1 and 2, and it made many of these characters, including newcomer Jin Kazama, household names that would be recognized with other gaming greats. For a franchise that started as just an experiment to see what Namco could do with their hardware when it came to modeling characters, the stratospheric rise of Tekken, all the way from Tekken 1 to Tekken 3, is truly something to behold. It set the tone for what a 3D fighting game was. Everybody became aware of it. And suddenly, it went from being this thing that people did in arcades in Japan to something that could even be at the same level of Mortal Kombat with Sub-Zero and Scorpion. Everybody knew who Jin was. Everybody wanted to play Tekken. And much like Mortal Kombat, that was thanks to its appeal to the casual market. Everybody, whether you were into fighting games or not, found the game appealing. And those transformations in how movesets and controls work made it so that anybody could grab a controller and press buttons and cool shit would happen. And that means you had a success on your hands. What started off as a mishmash of aesthetics and some cool music had now evolved into a defined style of its own. 
The characters had a personality, the story was crazy, and even if it doesn't look like the coolest stuff in the world right now, things like Devil Kazuya and Jin Kazama and King and Armor King, people loved them. They were characters that resonated and people liked playing as them and using their really cool moves. And so Tekken 3 had the difficult job of setting up something for the future. At its conclusion, Paul defeats Ogre after having defeated Kuma and Heihachi, and leaves thinking he's won, but Ogre absorbs Heihachi's energy to become TRUE OGRE. Jin Kazama then takes him down, only to be gunned down by the Tekken Force, because Heihachi doesn't need him anymore. But no, Jin wakes up due to the Devil Gene and takes everyone down and smacks the shit out of Heihachi through a wall before growing wings and flying away. It is absolutely bonkers and this is why I love Tekken. We would have to wait until 1999 to see the changes implemented for the sixth generation of consoles in the Tekken series and a full five years before the next numbered entry. Before, I covered a bit of Virtual Fighter, but as you might or might not have seen coming from this video's length, when I said I wanted context to Tekken success, that's not just playing Virtual Fighter. And so, I must cover a lot of games that appeared in this time period around Tekken 3 and before Tekken 4. So, here's some examples of the fighting game scene of the time. Dead or Alive would show up in 96 in arcades and appear in 98 for consoles and was quickly heralded as the next great fighting game. Even here at the very start it would feature something the series is very well known for. And that was featuring female fighters with some big emphasis on detail, let's say. No matter your preference on this sort of thing, DOA came out swinging. That was a poor choice of words. It's a two-button fighting game, similar to Virtual Fighter, and feels much closer to that than Tekken. But it brings its own twists. For starters, the absolutely spectacular visuals, with some gorgeous animation work that flows in a way that must have been mesmerizing at the time. And gameplay-wise, it brings counters. Aside from blocking, you have a dedicated counter that, when timed correctly, will either deal damage, reposition, or both to your opponent, rewarding defensive play, but a very risky defensive play that requires skill and timing to execute. Besides that, and introducing some now iconic characters, it's just a really good fighting game for the time. It feels very responsive, looks crisp, contains some cool characters, and is overall probably worthy of all the praise it received at the time. It's still in this tier of games that I don't recommend playing today, like Tekken 1, where I just feel like the amount of content and depth doesn't hold up beyond basic curiosity, where Tekken 2 and 3 have a bit more meat on the bone. But DOA 2, well, now we're talking. Dead or Alive 2 released in very late 99 and early 2000 on Dreamcast, and for the sake of pacing, I'm going to include it here despite it being a 6th gen release. But it's also previous to Tekken 4, so hey, there's that. Its biggest new thing, besides look at them graphics, is its cinematic flair with stage design, and this will be a really notable thing when we talk about Tekken 4. DOA 1 featured a ring, but instead of ring outs, getting knocked out of it would have you dramatically explode, taking damage and being launched upwards, and it was called the Danger Zone. But in DOA 2, the stages have evolved just as much as the movesets of fighters and the overall graphics. Stages look amazing, but feature multi-tiered arenas with hazards. Walls can be used for damage and pressure. Enemies can be launched through windows, thrown off cliffs and balconies, transitioning the stage to different arenas with more parts that can be interacted with. There's uneven terrain, water, snow, all sorts of stuff that looks great to fight through, and this would be one of DOA's staples moving forward. It also has a more robust story mode with cutscenes playing when characters face each other, leading to very short in-game endings that make no sense at all, or maybe they do. I'm not gonna research it, this is a Tekken video. Additionally, the gameplay feels faster, more fluid, and has the distinct weighty smack to it you associate with DOA, and this already feels very much like that, and it holds up very well today. But for every Dead or Alive or Virtual Fighter, there was a Kensei Sacred Fist. Oh yes, Konami wanted a piece of this pie. Now, this game is often regarded as a pretty bad Tekken clone, but I'll be honest, I played this a lot as a kid when I inherited a modded PS1 with tons of burned CDs. I understood nothing, had no perception of quality, and I loved it. 
I was very afraid to go back to it as an adult and see if it was good or not. And I was expecting the worst. And really, it's pretty damn okay. Good even. Kensei has a vibe, mostly thanks to having an amazing soundtrack by Akira Yamaoka that, judging from the OST YouTube videos, people remember very fondly, all 15 of us who played it back then. It's a pretty basic fighting game, it has strings for buttons plus directions, some combos, and slightly interesting grapple system. It has a ton of characters, which I thought would be clones, but not really. They're slightly different, although nobody is better than Parrot Man. I love Parrot Man. It doesn't have anything that really revolutionizes, well, anything, but it looks good, plays pretty okay. Not close to the best games here, but it's serviceable. And when you unlock everything, which I did back in the day and remember very vividly, you unlock the extra mode, which is a racing mode, where you straight up run through a black void. And it's hilarious and awesome. Please give me a racing mode like this in Tekken 8 Namco. I'm begging. Now the big one might very well be Virtua Fighter 3, releasing in arcades in 96, much like DOA, and coming to Dreamcast, since this is Sega after all, in 98. I played Virtua Fighter 3 Team Battle, which is the updated version, which was just re-released with online in arcades in November of 93 in Japan, and I found this game to be fun but not really great. There's a charm and a strong feeling of being so ahead of everyone to Virtua Fighter 2, but 3 feels kinda just like okay. It looks better, but it's nothing like what DOA 2 would do on the PS2, and its big change is mostly the uneven terrain on stages and the team battle, which I didn't play. Oh yeah, and it's 3D, like it has sidestepping, proper sidestepping. It added the fourth button for a dodge as well, which allows you to sidestep up or down, and that's pretty big. But the rest of it doesn't feel like a big departure, it's Virtua Fighter, so it still has a standard of quality that's overall very high, but it didn't wow me with a change in style or immediately noticeable gameplay changes. So as a non-expert of Virtua Fighter, I can guess there's a lot of other stuff under the hood, because this beat out Tekken 2 in arcades on release. But fearing the same result as before and looking to appeal to the Westerners that love Tekken, Fighting Vipers 2 was made in tow. But these games ended up on Dreamcast, although Virtua Fighter 3 was promised for Saturn, but the Saturn just couldn't handle these games. And Fighting Vipers 2 to me is like really good, especially compared to Virtual Fighter 2 and the transition to Fighting Vipers 1. The transition from Virtual Fighter 3 TB to Fighting Vipers 2 is very different. Now, it does have some steps back. Specifically, Fighting Vipers 2 does not have the ability to sidestep. But especially when playing Virtual Fighter and Fighting Vipers back to back, this one is so much faster and it's got a kinetic energy to it that really nails the arcade feel. Where Virtual Fighter still has that, it does feel a little bit floaty in a lot of its movements and its hits. Where Fighting Vipers 2 has this slam to everything, including the walls. It has the ridiculous teching with the big green circles that appear when you tech something to recover in the air. The ridiculous ring outs where you just throw somebody into the lava. There's so many cool things about this game. While the soundtrack of Virtual Fighter 3 TB is excellent and still has that groovy Sega tune to it, Fighting Vipers 2 sounds like what would happen if I entered into a hard rock bar downtown in my city but I suddenly became pixelated the moment I opened the door. It's got all of these rock influences of what was considered edgy and cool back then, with all of these guitar riffs and these heavy bass lines that make me love the soundtrack, truly. There's helicopters everywhere, including the intro, I'm assuming because since they made the helicopter, they might as well use it everywhere. And it also has Charlie, which is not only a Muay Thai fighter, He's a Muay Thai fighter with a BMX on his back, and might as well be the only character in the history of fighting games that has a stance switch into riding a BMX. It's stupid as all heck, and I do think it is less balanced, less technical than Virtual Fighter 3, but I also think it's more fun. So, yeah, I'm sorry, Fighting Vipers, that you just got left in the dust. I know that maybe you wouldn't age well if you were brought up to today's standards, but... I think we should still try, so if you're here listening to this, remember that in your comment that you should leave, hashtag Fighting Vipers 3. Let's go, Sega. Let's get the Yakuza people to make Fighting Vipers 3. Don't you think that would be, like, the best combination in the history of crazy fighting games?
Now, the other one that I had never played was Bloody Roar, and man, uh, I'm into this intro screen very much, and this game is kind of insane. Uh, I think I love Bloody Roar. 1998 is a fair few years since Tekken 3 saw its home console release, so it had become very difficult to compete, with everyone comparing anything that vaguely looked like Tekken with IT, Virtua Fighter, and Dead or Alive. But Bloody Roar is definitely one of the top competitors. I had never played it, and man was I very surprised. You have a small roster of eight, all with very diverse movesets, because they're all designed around one central gimmick. You can transform into an animal. A wolf, a rabbit, a lion, the ninja can become a mole. That's pretty wild. It's a three-button game with punch, kick, and transform, which might as well be my favorite button. And while you're transformed, you get access to that third button for its own combos and specials. And it's all very intuitive. There's deep enough movesets to explore, and it brings in a couple of really interesting mechanics that, while I'm not a fighting game historian, feel really ahead of their time. For starters, there's walls, which until now I've only seen in fighting vipers, much like in that game, you can corner your opponents for pressure and bounce them off the wall for combos, but the walls can be broken, allowing for ringouts. While walls might sound like a dumb thing to harp on, but it is really important in both 2D and 3D fighting games, where the idea of the edges of the screen and wall bounces are integral to combos and pressure. They add an element of strategy and stage control much like ringouts would, but in this case, it's because being pressured into a wall not only limits your options, but can make getting hit extremely punishing, as moves that previously simply dealt damage now splat you or bounce you, leading to follow-up hits. Bloody Roar also has ship damage, which is when you take a little bit of damage when blocking. Sometimes all moves, sometimes only some moves, and it's a pretty common thing in fighting games moving forward, but it also features recoverable health. When you take damage, a portion of your health is grayed out, and transforming allows you to recover that portion of health, much like you can in tag games for the tagged out player. Beyond this, the game looks bloody gorgeous. The animation work, the stages, and even the soundtrack all fit stylistically into this chaotic, vibrant, and bouncy mood that the characters channel in their overly exaggerated animations. I gravitated towards Alice the Rabbit, haha, <laughs> get it? who has tons of jumps and launchers for cool juggle combos. Also, the final boss is a cow, I think. Who knows? Bloody Roar 2 would change up the roster, although leave the same number of eight fighters, with Shenlong the Tiger being an unlockable. It also trying to take the series in a darker direction that I don't enjoy as much. It's all more cohesive thematically and stylistically, but also a strange edgy vibe. Also, they added the Batgirl for that dead or alive demographic. Oh no, Japan. Oh no, what, what, what have I done this? There's wacky stuff in these games, and it feels like there's a ton of systems and depth to each character and transformation. Both of these games feature fairly long rounds with high health pools, but also the potential for absurdly long combos that can take off 50% of your HP in a balance that I tend to enjoy in fighting games. There are plenty of differences in mechanics, even with core things and cool stuff, like how you can jump off stage walls when transformed. It uses 3D space well enough with dodge moves, but mostly for the giant arenas with plenty of ways to end up with your back to your opponent and running from one side to the other, kind of like a wrestling game. But if there's one selling point to Bloody Roar, it's how satisfying hits connect. There's this crunch and pop to landing hits and combos, with a weight behind running kicks that send opponents flying that doesn't feel like an anime fighter, and instead really conveys that these are genetically modified superhuman-animal hybrids that are launching each other across the entire stage. And it's my first genuine surprise in this video towards two games that have blown me away. Bloody Roar 2 also features an actual story mode instead of just arcade mode, with different art and dialogue going through the character stories, which no, I will not be recapping in this video. Also, the ninja in Bloody Roar 2 is just Strider, and I love that. From here, it'd be only a year until Tekken Tag on PS2, and we'll be staying in Tekken land for a bit, but we'll catch up with series like Bloody Roar and more obscure competitors and clones as we keep going through the years. But Bloody Roar is an excellent send-off to the first act of this video, which is now 
Oh wow, that's really long. Anyways, the sixth generation of consoles came with Tekken Tag Tournament. Thankfully, we don't have to cover the story because Tekken Tag are spin-offs and don't feature any canon storytelling, although they do have some very amusing endings. Instead, we get to talk about how Tekken initially transitioned to the sixth generation. Graphics have been overhauled, if not as shiny and system selling as you might expect or see coming up from contemporaries, but the biggest change is, of course, the tag mechanics. Today, when we think of tag fighters, we probably think of things like Marvel vs. Capcom 2, but Tekken Tag wasn't really jumping in on a trend as far as my research goes beyond things like Virtua Fighter 3. It just seems like they wanted to make a tag game, not to chase anything, but because they wanted to. And this brings with it a whole host of changes, and honestly, it's really good in my opinion. We'll get to it in a very long while, but Tekken Tag 2 is also pretty dope, and I think it's the most underrated entry in the series, but Tag here brings some awesome stuff. For starters, you're able to tag in and out fairly easily, without many conditioning factors. You simply press the tag button, even when on the ground, to tag. You probably don't want to do this while getting pressured, since the opponent can react and slam the incoming combatant, but you can do it really effectively on the offensive, with juggle tags that combo, although only with some pairs of characters, and grab tags, which are exactly that, grabs that also tag. There's also a more in-depth defense system, with reversals and counters being more prominent, and it even has a chicken mode to point out when a player is playing too cowardly. It honestly does a ton of stuff, including adding a flashing bar after not tagging for a while, which means that tagging in now would give that new character that gets tagged in extra damage. But the most important part, gameplay-wise, is the pacing. Tekken Tag, compared to the Capcom vs. games, would not have you lose when both characters lose their HP, but instead when any character loses all of their HP. The amount of HP refill on the character tagged out is pretty big, and when combining these two things, the game feels very strategic and leads to long matches compared to Tekken 3 matches that could be, you know, very, very short. Damage seems lowered, or HP is buffed, depending on how you want to see it, so even an all-out rushdown is difficult, and while you can still eat up 50% of your opponent's health bar if you really know what you're doing, it's not common for it to happen off of, like, two common moves like it could happen before. In the end, this means that those longer matches can be, at least to me, quite fun, as tension builds, life bars are managed, defensive play occurs more, but offensive play is very heavily rewarded as you can just straight up win if you get a successful combo off on a defensive opponent. It's really damn fun to me, and the huge 35 character roster helps. Tekken Tag is great, man. It's just fun and well made, but I don't recommend it that much anymore. We'll talk about it in 12 years, not literally, but in 12 years, like within the video chronology. For now, let's talk about 2001, the turn of the millennium, a new culture, a new style, a new Tekken, Tekken 4. As it boldly announces all throughout, Tekken 4 is a new century of fighting, but it's still Tekken. Just that some mechanics change and so do the graphics. Look at the clothes, look at the smoke. The crowd, the Fundoshi, the Heihachi. Tekken 4 is often considered the black sheep of the series due to its large amount of changes, from aesthetics to lack of content to gameplay. It tries really hard to establish itself as something different from what came before, which is slightly odd considering that Tekken 3 already had a time skip and established a new protagonist, but this time they attempt to incorporate these changes in gameplay that makes it feel slightly lost in its identity for a while. But also aesthetically, Tekken 4 is just very different. It's very blue, very turn of the millennium cool shade of fancy futuristic blue. And all of the new designs feel like they're trying to be whatever they thought was modern at the time. I mean, look at Paul. My boy, what have they done to you, Paul? The story, thankfully, while still covered in that new direction, is as wacky as ever. We have six new characters with Christy Montero, which is Eddie Gordo's student, and she wants a cure for her grandfather, who is Eddie Gordo's teacher. Craig Marduk is a Valley Tudo fighter, and he killed Armor King, but King 2, which is Armor King's student I will remind you, is baiting him into the tournament to get revenge. Steve Fox, and Steve is a big one, because Fox is Nina Williams' son. Because I skipped over it a bit earlier, but during the time skip Nina was put into cryosleep by the evil Dr. Abel and they, um, 
made Steve during this, attempting to create the perfect Tekken 4 soldier. Steve finds out that Nina is his mom in Tekken 4, and then she's like, well that's cool. And finally, Combot, a robot that can perfectly imitate any fighting style. You might think this has to do with the Zaibatsu, but no, this has to do with Violet, who is a new character. Also, he is not. He is Lee Chaolan, who now has started his own robotics company, Violet, and he has a catchphrase now. Excellent. So the story here is a wild ride, but I'll do my best. Heihachi has Ogre's blood, but he can't use it without the devil gene, so he wants to lure out Jin with a tournament, but also Kazuya's body. It was retrieved by the G Corporation, so he wants the body, but it turns out that Kazuya was revived, and he wipes out the Tekken Force sent to get his body. Jin now hates the Mishima bloodline and is learning traditional karate, which means he no longer plays like a Mishima. Boo! People are sad! So with the ultimate goal of obtaining the Devil Gene, Heihachi hosts a tournament and he doesn't care if it's his son or his grandson. He wants one of them in order to become a devil himself and use ogre blood to become immortal. As for everyone else in the story, well, Brian is abandoned by Dr. Abel which makes him enter the tournament in hopes of convincing Abel to keep upgrading his body to become the Ultra Cyborg once more, but instead Brian loses and then he kills Abel and Yoshimitsu takes him to Boskanovich to save his life and get him a new body. Oh right, because Brian is actually dying in that body, sorry I forgot. Julia needs data that G Corp had on reforestation that was stolen by the Zaibatsu, so she joins in order to steal it back, but she doesn't. Kuma too actually defeats Paul, but he will also be sad because Heihachi Mishima is, is yeah. Xiaoyu enters to reconnect with Jin after what happened between 3 and 4, but during that, Yoshimitsu saves her from Heihachi's plan and informs her of the Mishima bloodline. From here on out, Xiaoyu will fight to save Jin's soul from evil. And Nina is actually in the tournament because she's hired to take down Steve Fox, which again is her son. But she doesn't do it because Lei Wulong is there to take down the Syndicate, which is the evil organization that hired her to do so. So when Lei takes them down, she gives up, saying that nobody will pay her. Also, Nina knows that Steve is her son. It's just that she really doesn't care. And the stage is set for the tournament. We pick our fighters and play Tekken 4. Overall, Tekken 4 feels a bit like a half step forward and a half step back in different directions. Obviously, its graphics are a huge appeal for a franchise that has really captured success within the casual audience, but in that pursuit they developed new stages that are actually quite similar to the approach from DOA 2 and Virtua Fighter 3 having elevation changes and slightly interactive environments, with things like the infamous phone booths that can be used for wall bounces, but only once since they get destroyed. The problem is that unlike DOA 2, the elevation changes often get in the way of fighting. Certain moves won't hit, grapples can interact strangely, and it overall feels unfair and unpredictable when playing on stages with uneven terrain. Some of the aesthetic changes also don't help, with it being this shiny corporate futuristic style that is just kind of strange. It has an early 2000s espionage action vibe to it, with that bluish metallic color palette where natural yellows obtain a golden tint that just screams early Instagram photo filters. And I don't hate it, but this is a departure from the more colorful, I would say very natural looking Tekken 3 and Tekken Tag. The stage selection, since they are more integral parts of the gameplay now, are worth commenting on, because while we have lush beaches and grand stages, we also have parking lot, shopping district, building a roof. It's not that these are bad, it's just that they're kind of boring. They aren't thematic to the characters, they all feel like they take place in the same city. And while there's merit to that, it's also just slightly disappointing to lose so much personality from the other games. Even Tekken Tag, which featured some really cool stages and even some really funny jokes like Mishima Polytechnical with the statue of Heihachi. On the gameplay front, Tekken 4 feels a bit weird. While the inclusion of walls adds a really important layer to strategy and combos, it also brought the inclusion of side switches with grabs. To increase the use of stages, mobility has changed drastically. Side steps are now much shorter, but you can just hold up or down to continuously walk around, with jump now being reserved for forward jumps on the forward up input. Now you might call me crazy, but I actually like this movement style and it's a window into a very different version of Tekken that uses it. And other 3D fighting games had opted for holding a button to unlock moving up and down, 
and those are also interesting to me. It's a big change, bigger than it seems, and one they'd go back on, but not necessarily a bad one, just a very fundamental one that would have needed to be iterated on and designed upon further. The big problem wasn't any of this, however, it was how much combos have been nerfed. For as much as they're incentivized with walls, the damage requires decent execution and isn't very rewarding. Instead, a lot of the more efficient tactics revolved around a movement into jabs and very short strings with defensive play in footsies. At this stage, jab speeds would vary wildly, so certain characters were just better, like newcomer Steve Fox. And it turns out that a very footsie heavy, jab heavy, and flashy move and combo lacking gameplay wasn't fun to play and it wasn't fun to watch. It overall felt a little confused, but in a difficult way to describe. While some changes we could argue were difficult to predict, like the combo damage leading to the jab-heavy gameplay, other changes were made with clear goals in mind, and they executed that vision. So if it did what it set out to do, how can you call it confused? Well, because the identity of the series was feeling fairly solid in Tekken 3. It's a flashy 3D fighter with an iconic cast, really damaging moves, especially on counter hit. It's fast paced and full of spectacle that gets crazier and crazier as time goes on. But Tekken 4 made it a less flashy series by taking away that explosive fast paced nature. And while the weirdness remains, as we saw in the story section, the aesthetic clashed a bit more with it, and a lot of the outward appearance while normally playing is that the game is a more serious, slightly boring change, and then it goes crazy with the actual story and the endings. Now, unfortunately for those that enjoy bashing games, I really like to find the best in things and remain positive, which should tell you something about the times I just outright go off on something. So Tekken 4 to me is not great, but it is kind of cool. I enjoy some of the new characters, like Steve and Marduk, and Jin's rework to stop being a classic Mishima is interesting and would lead into what he is. New Jin is really strong, by the way. What really brings down Tekken 4 for me is that if I wanted to just play good Tekken at this point, I'd rather play Tag. It has more characters, interesting mechanics with depth in the Tag department, and its experimentation into longer matches is a fun twist on the game while still remaining decidedly Tekken in what you want to do. And as such, while I appreciate the differences in Tekken 4, and I actually really like its soundtrack, and I will be honest, after this retrospective, I like it more than I did before, I think it's still my least favorite Tekken besides one, which is a special case all on its own. It's a weird sidestep into a different version of Tekken, one that tried the whole Virtual Fighter 3 and DOA 2 uneven stages and with a different aesthetic, but one that would ultimately flop in its reception both from fans and sales, even if some critics praise it, but that was mostly because of the graphics, let's be honest. The story ends with Jin, Heihachi, and Kazuya at Honmaru, where Heihachi has Jin chained up. Kazuya reveals that when he was thrown into the volcano, half of his devil spirit split and possessed Jin, and he calls out to Jin, so that it wakes up. Devil Jin defeats both of them, but spares them, and flies away, leaving Kazuya and Heihachi in Honmaru. It took three long years for Tekken to return, and Tekken 5 would be worth the wait. I've learned over time that what I used to think were very personal experiences, once opened up to the world, are actually things that are more common than I thought. Such is the nature of life. So I know many of you will be on my same timeline. When I was younger, Tekken was introduced into my life by older family members and visits to arcades, but I was too young to appreciate it for myself. I just know I loved playing it with my cousins, and when you're young and before the internet, the world is small, it's basically what surrounds you and not much more, including those trips to the arcade, enjoying my free time playing different light gun games and arcade racers. But when Tekken 5 came out, I was old enough to understand that this was it. And for me and my friends, this was our Tekken 3. And I was now at the age at which my cousins introduced me to Tekken. Tekken 5 was my generation's fighting game. And boy, was it special. Tekken 5 begins exactly when Tekken 4 ends, showing Heihachi and Kazuya team up to fight G Corporation's surprise attack. During the fight, Kazuya betrays Heihachi, although I'm not sure if I can call it a betrayal considering they were only teaming up very briefly, and also, 
Heihachi Mishima is dead. Except not at all. Two months later, a new Tekken tournament is held. Who is hosting it? Why? Well, who knows? But there's a lot of story to cover for our contestants. In Dr. Boskanovich's lab, a saved Brian Fury wakes up and unleashes his fury, and Yoshimitsu discovers the ordeal, swearing revenge by fighting Brian in the tournament. Paul enters the tournament after having been defeated by Kuma last time, motivated for revenge. We won't cover Paul more after this since he beats Kuma but has to drop out, and he will enter the future tournaments looking for money to stop being always in debt. King 2 sees news of a man in Armor King's mask is defeating opponents left and right, and is publicly challenging him to a fight. Convinced, not sure how, that Marduk was behind it and he is using his former master's mask. He enters the tournament to fight Marduk, and Marduk wants a fair rematch, which leaves King confused, and after he wins and they talk it out, they become friends, now understanding that Marduk isn't donning the Armor King mask, but then who is? Well, it's Armor King's partner, which is also his brother. Lee enters to confront Kazuya and regain control of the Zaibatsu, but when he figures out who actually controls the Zaibatsu, he bows out. We'll talk about it in a second. Lee will be really important in future installments though. Nina and Anna are here and fighting. Nina still has amnesia, and she decides Anna can help her recover her memory, so they fight to the death. They draw and decide to fight during the tournament, and they are weird and it will get weirder, but anyways, Team Anna for life. Lei Wulong is here in pursuit of Feng Wei, newcomer to the series who is obsessed with a secret scroll that can turn you into the ultimate warrior, and to find it, he ends the life of his master as well as going around destroying dojos, including Asuka Kazama's family dojo, who is Jin's cousin and is also new. And by the way, the ultimate scroll is empty and all it says is that the real learnings are the ones that you had with your friends on the teachings of the path of the way in the destinations. Ganryu is back because he saw Julia fight on TV in Tekken 4 and he fell in love, so he wants to ask her to marry him along with helping her reforestation efforts. Some of these plotlines are so dumb and somehow perfect at the same time, and I don't know how Tekken does it. Speaking of which, Roger Jr. is Roger's son. Roger is the fighting kangaroo, by the way, in case you forgot. He's too young, so he fights in his mother's pouch, and they enter to find out what happened to Roger, who's been missing. They found out he's just been slacking off with his mistresses, and Roger's wife, who doesn't have an official name, but I'm calling her Roberta. Once they find out, Roberta and Roger Jr. take a liking to Roger's former rival, Alex, the boxing dinosaur, and they end up a happy family again, but with Alex. However, during the events of Tekken 6 and 7, eventually Roberta and Roger make up, so maybe Roger will be back in Tekken 8 DLC. Also, I'm Team Alex. Roger is kind of a douche. Ling Xiaoyu has a pretty sad story from here on out. She finds out about the Mishima bloodline and wants to save Jin but can't quite do it, and this will repeat throughout the next games. I always hated Xiaoyu, and her story actually makes me like her, and Panda, by extension, a lot more. So take that, people who say the story doesn't matter. Eddie Gordo and Christy want technology from the Zaibatsu to save Christy's grandfather, which is also Eddie's master from when he was in prison. Martial Law is here for money, but he and Paul motivate Steve Fox to enter the tournament because he wants to find out stuff about Nina. And finally, Wang Jinrei is here because he knows what's up, and he's defeated by Jin before the end of the story. And now we can play some Tekken. And Tekken 5 feels like a true sequel to Tekken 3, even if under the hood there's a lot of changes. Developers themselves have said that it was envisioned as the true sequel to Tekken 3, internally as well. A way to course correct, back to what fans were asking for. Today when we talk about remakes, we mention things like them playing or looking like how we remember the originals, but the originals are actually older, stiffer, and have a host of things we don't like anymore. Well, that's how Tekken 5 feels compared to Tekken 3. Tekken 5 is the natural successor to Tekken 3. It's a higher resolution, higher detail, beautiful evolution that just feels at home when switching between Tekken 3 and IT. Which you can do, by the way, because Tekken 5 brings back all of the extra content you love from Tekken before 4, including arcade playable versions of Tekken 1, 2, and 3. How's that for content? The ports here, according to people, have some issues, and I wanted to cover the console versions primarily in this video. And since I have no clue about setting up and properly recording my old PS2 and copies of the Tekken games, I chose to emulate everything. 
since honestly, if you want to play old games today, I think it makes sense to use technology in our favor and make them look a bit better for modern displays or run better. And I bring this up because aside from PSN releases with Sony's whole thing of re-releasing older games on there, Namco has done a piss-poor job of preserving these games. Re-releases aren't really a thing, they've never been properly remastered or put into a collection, and even recent entries like 6 and Tag 2 completely skip PC even to this day. So Tekken 5 has some very notable extra value in it having those arcade ports in there. It also has the standard offerings of survival, time attack, and practice, but it brings two very interesting and important additions, customization and Devil Within. Fighting now awards fight money, which you can spend on different parts to make your characters look goofy. Now, honestly, it's bare bones here, but I remember thinking this was awesome and hilarious back in the day, and I'm sure this was a huge hit in arcades where they used the card systems. Also, we'll talk about maybe where Tekken got this idea from in a bit. But it would evolve and continue until today. Devil Within will have a more complex relationship with future games, including one very important upcoming one. But it's the third person evolution of Tekken Force, but it's also pretty bad. Considering I barely remembered anything about it when playing through it, I'm pretty sure I thought the same almost 20 years ago. The camera is now free and controlled with the right stick, but once you lock on, there's no traditional control so you get access to four whole combos. Wow, I feel spoiled for choice. It also looks pretty bad, with the maze-like structure not being helped by the bland, empty halls. There's some light platforming and box puzzles and stuff, but it was easily the worst part of this entire video, except the Heihachi baby room. But considering some of the bosses in these games, calling Devil Within the worst part of all of Tekken is really saying something especially when swapping from the still gorgeous fighting game to this barren and sparse side mode. Speaking of which, Tekken 5 really returns to the fast, fluid, high damage combat, and with how many classic characters return as well as cool newcomers, it really helped, along with the colorful, bouncy, and vibrant aesthetic, in feeling like the true sequel to 3. It added some technically complex changes to move properties to better differentiate what can hit what and when, like how low attacks and jumps interact, basically for the sake of making things more predictable and standardized. It was also horribly unbalanced, to the point that arcades were updated to 5.1, which nerfed all ground attacks, those being the attacks on opponents that are on the ground, by 30%, and they fixed Steve and Kazuya. Because man, Steve really does keep causing problems. But it plays and feels like Tekken, a really good version of it at least. And it will also be the last time that I have to set rounds to 1 and difficulty to easy and unlock everything for the video. The experience was fun, the visuals appealing, it was great, except for Jinpachi. Seriously, screw this guy. His instant ground stomp stun, his fireball that can be a double fireball with the second tracking your sidestep, it's all trash. He returns to that feeling of the boss lets you win, because if he wanted to, he would always win. Perma stun stomp and multi fireball bullshit. God, this just felt like a toss up more than any other boss in the series. We'll see some other absolute garbage later on, but they felt like I was bad at the game and wasn't strategizing accordingly, and I had to learn their moves and block and punish. Jinpachi is simply repeating over and over until he decides to not stun you, slam, stun, and then slam. <sighs> this was infuriating back in my best friend's basement passing the controller in 2006, and it's still just as bad in 2024. But at its core, Tekken 5 feels like Tekken's final form. The weird aesthetic and clash between moody seriousness is gone, and the sun-kissed, goofy feel of Tekken is all over this game. Certain things were done to make it feel like it's made for fans, with Devil Jin, who is classic Tekken 3 and Tekken Tag Jin, but with the excuse of being the devil version. So normal Jin still rejects the Mishima style and does his own thing, but Devil Jin is full Mishima for the people who missed classic Jin. A lot of staple characters would be brought in as well, with Raven and Feng Wei being quite popular moving forward, so it caters to older players while still bringing in characters that were very well accepted. To me, the most interesting part of Tekken 5 when playing it through the context of the entire series is how it's very lightly hinting at what will come, but without changing anything of what you love. 
Sure, it has more juggles, but it doesn't yet incorporate bound moves, which I might as well explain now, but it's a way to continue combos and will become the natural flow of Tekken combos, as they transition from the way they work in Tekken 5 which here is either normal combos like linking various attacks together or launching into a juggle and then juggling the opponent. The standard later on will become launchers into a juggle that ends in a bound and bounds throw the opponent onto the ground but allow you to continue your combo kind of like they're bouncing off the ground. Because this game plays like Tekken 3 instead of 4, combos and juggles are more important. But it still has the walls of Tekken 4, leading to those juggles wanting to be wall carry, which is when you carry the opponent as far as possible to lead into a wall splat so that you can do extra damage and pressure. So it's hinting at what the future gameplay-wise will be. But I think what a lot of people remember Tekken 5 for is being a very full package. It's something that I think many of us remember from that golden age of console fighting games with things like Soul Calibur's different modes, where even if you had no friends, these games were great purchases, and Tekken 5 is a great playing fighting game packed with content that was successful for very clear reasons. And now for the only game that I didn't play for this video, so yeah, I guess I lied, I didn't play every Tekken game because I didn't play Dark Resurrection Online on PS3, the port of Tekken 5 with three extra characters, rebalance, and online. Mostly because playing it isn't easy, and recording it is even harder. It is what it says on the tin, and we'll talk about the characters that debut much more in Tekken 6, but Dark Resurrection itself is highly regarded as one of the best competitive Tekken games before Tekken starts going wild. And this is really where the proper competitive balance begins for the games, since Tekken 5's standard was still horribly unbalanced. But before we move on to Tekken 6, we have a lot of stuff to talk about, as a lot of other fighting games that came out in the 6th generation. But you already knew that, because you know the length of the video, which I still don't. Oh god, as I keep making this video, I keep wondering if I bit off way more than I can chew, but also this is fun, and a video that I would like to watch, so I'll inevitably do something as wild as this again. So hey, please subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of this. And subscribing has a direct impact on the likelihood I will do this madness again. And tell me in the comments if there's another series, fighting or not, that you like to see this style of video for. Please. Anyways, at the end of Tekken 5, Jin defeats Jinpachi, and before that he defeats Huarang and Wang Jinrei, who was super best friends with him so many years ago. Jin becomes the head of the Mishima Zaibatsu, and taking over the company, he's about to establish new world peace. Just not in the way you expect. But before that, that's right ladies and gentlemen, it's time for another round of WTF was going on with other fighting games. Ooh. So let's start off with Tough, Dark Fight, because I want to start off with some of the arguably bottom of the barrel stuff. We aren't in the PS1 days, where there were boatloads of fighting games and a lot of bigger fighting game sagas really take shape during the 6th gen. So. I won't cover Mortal Kombat, Soul Calibur, or Dead or Alive, or anything like that very in-depth, since those series get very big and complex around this time, and would really warrant their own videos. Nor will I cover 2D fighting games, obviously. So when it comes to the 3D space, a great example of people that were still throwing stuff at the wall is Tough Dark Fight, a Japanese-only game based on a manga, which I can describe as manly. It's pretty damn bad and confusing, not helped by the lack of info online and it being in Japanese. But thankfully, I had the opportunity to play it with a friend, meaning it was fun to laugh at and be confused at. Really, this is here to show off how experimentation started dying off in the genre, as naturally, winds shifted towards other genres and budgets increased to really compete. But some games like this one still managed to exist. I do not recommend Tough Dark Fight, by the way, you, you shouldn't play this game. But an interesting one is King of Fighters Maximum Impact, also known as You Wouldn't Steal a Fighting Game, Would You? This is a little bit more complex, because it plays like King of Fighters. Now this is a fighting game that is very interesting, because while it isn't 3D and it has sidestepping and you can roll through things like King of Fighters, it also plays like King of Fighters. I don't think this is the place to explain all of King of Fighters, so if you're not really familiar, 
think something very similar to Street Fighter. It's a lot of projectiles, a lot of possible distance with very big arenas, and that leads to it feeling very much like a 2D fighter, but in 3D instead of a 3D fighter. Having said that, I don't dislike it. I think it's pretty fun, and it has some depth to it. And it's very different from something like Tekken. And Maximum Impact 2 simply follows the trend and expands on it. Ultimately, these are considered missteps, as SNK would go back to 2D after this, which I think is the right choice for the franchise. But when it comes to 3D adaptations of 2D fighters, this one is really damn good in my book, and I respect both of these games. I can't speak to balance or how good they are as competitive games, but they're both highly enjoyable and worth going back to, and they definitely had that My Shirani flair going for them. If there's anything bad to say here, it's that graphically for games from 04 and 06, especially Maximum Impact 2, is disappointing. But when it comes to playing, they're both interesting enough to be alright and worth revisiting. I also played Street Fighter EX3 for this video, and I just thought it was a 2D game. It really didn't feel very 3D at all. It's like a weird experiment in Street Fighter history, and really that franchise is very big on its own for me to take this one outlier and compare it to other 3D fighting games. But I think King of Fighters does a very good job at translating what makes the franchise what it is work in 3D. I mean, maybe it doesn't work work, but it's still very definitely King of Fighters, and that's interesting to play. On a weirder note, Bloody Roar. I told you we'd return. Bloody Roar 3 is a great game, and I'm serious, especially the GameCube version more than the PS2 version, and that's because they are different games, with Bloody Roar 3 being kind of okay. It's Bloody Roar 2, but better looking and with some different mechanical changes, but overall people complained that it was getting stale. To me at least, Bloody Roar Primal Fury for GameCube, which is a retweaked version of that game with new models, altered movesets, and new stages, flows beautifully. It's over the top, adds interesting changes to the transformation gimmick, it looks amazing even today, and most importantly, plays silky smooth with the characteristic slam and impact that Bloody Roar has. One of the big changes is that there's a bigger power imbalance now between being transformed or not, and to my feel, you spend a lot more time fighting transformed, almost as if that's the neutral state, with losing it being a punishment for poor play and a strategy element. Whereas before it felt like untransformed was the default, and the transformation was like a power-up. And this new system leads to fast, flashy fights that also feel very unique in having these characters that are huge monsters being the fighters, showing off that big gimmick much more in a way that's fun. It also has a final boss that's both a harpy and a penguin, so who doesn't love that? But this would take a turn for the worse, in Bloody Roar 4, however. For as much as Bloody Roar 3 wasn't the biggest departure and it didn't propel the series forward in the way that other series would, like Virtual Fighter or Dead or Alive, Bloody Roar 4, for many people, was a big regression. It now has a dual life bar kind of system, where your beast mode takes damage while you're in it, and then when you're not, you take normal damage, but taking or dealing damage gives you beast bar, so you and your opponent are constantly transforming and regaining HP in bouts that feel unbalanced and very long. You can also cash in your beast bar for a special attack, but I never really found that to be worth it. And also, if you lose your normal health bar but have transform bar ready, you automatically transform for the remaining beast bar available. And it doesn't help that after progressing through arcade mode, the input reading in this game gets PS1 level dumb, which I didn't notice in Bloody Roar 3 nearly as much. It's very noticeable in games like Virtua Fighter and Bloody Roar that have block buttons, because if you block, you'll get grabbed the instant you press it in later stages. This is all in stark contrast to the career mode of Bloody Roar 4, which is like a really boring plane mission mode. You simply move through a grid and beat single round fights to get points which unlock the characters, and I cross the whole thing to the final missions which give you the most points, but the entire affair was brain dead easy and felt like a waste of time. These missions are not soul caliber, they do not add cool quirks or gimmicks or objectives, you just fight. So I'm very sorry, but I did not continue torturing myself in order to unlock all of the characters. I cannot play 
as Penguin Man. Also, the stages in Bloody Roar 4 have these blue force fields around them that take away a lot of the charm from Primal Fury and makes the stages themselves feel like boring set dressing, and also they're tiny. At least in Bloody Roar 3, when they were tiny, it's because you were meant to, like, destroy them and have crazy stuff happen. Also, the movesets are all worse, and characters that I'd learned, like Alice, feel very changed and have lost access to strings I loved in favor of much more automatic combos, where it's just mashing the same button for a lot of damage, and it just didn't have the same vibrant energy as the previous ones. It's not terrible, but I'd rather play Primal Fury, so that's sad. But hey, Primal Fury's really good, so that's good. I also played a couple of other things, like Project Justice, which I enjoyed, but I'm not going to include here because I feel that most of how that game feels is similar to KOF for me. It's just something that is a 2D fighter with a 3D interpretation of it, but it's very unique in a way that deserves coverage of its own. But rest assured, I love Project Justice and very well might talk about it someday in the future. Maybe in a Capcom retrospective or a Street Fighter one, maybe on its own, but if you would like me to do that, uh, comment below and then subscribe. But now, we do have to talk about Virtua Fighter 4. Specifically, Virtua Fighter 4 Evolution, but Virtua Fighter 4 released a bit after Tekken 4, and while it's a very different game than Tekken 4 and 5, it's really damn good. This is a big jump from 3, and it plays beautifully, if a bit slow for my taste. And this really brought Virtua Fighter forward, competing graphically and especially animation-wise. I think it surpasses Tekken and Soul Calibur, it also came with Quest Mode, which is basically what Arcade Quest is in Tekken 8, and it's a fantastic mode where you dart around the world map and go to arcades to fight people, rank up, and unlock customization options for characters, which is where the Tekken 5 thing came from very probably. It ditched the uneven arenas, but it's just a phenomenal Virtua Fighter game, although not my favorite. I respect the hell out of this game, and especially Quest Mode, for adding NPCs that do a great job of imitating player styles, with some of them being overly defensive, some of them attempting to abuse unsafe moves, and whatever else you can think of. And this means that rising up the ranks also means you defeat opponents that mimic real players in ways I think teaches newer players while keeping them engaged in the progression and the unlockables. It's damn fantastic. but. Releasing in 2006 for the seventh gen of consoles, after Tekken 5, but still before Tekken 6, is Virtua Fighter 5. And for this video, I played Final Showdown, since I don't have access to Ultimate Showdown. And damn, is VF5 just amazing. This game deserves more praise, and honestly, I would kill for a Virtua Fighter 6. It's so much more fluid, faster, and somehow way more complex, all in ways that I love. It's probably still my preference between all 3D fighting games until many years into the future, and I haven't played Ultimate, which could be my favorite at this point, I don't know. It's so snappy and fun, and while I love a lot of the stuff that Tekken does, there's a part of me that, comparing Tekken 5 and 6 to VF5, I'd rather play VF5. As a mild spoiler, this doesn't hold up all the way until today, and I can't speak to intricacies of VF5 the way I can around Tekken, so maybe it falls apart later. But I can tell you that I think this game feels snappy and satisfying in ways that fighting games wouldn't achieve in the same way for many years to come. Although, that is simply my opinion. Tekken's biggest competitor comes to a close in this retrospective with a very interesting legacy. One of setting trends, floundering before its competition, and failing to really compete against it in popularity and cool factor. It never reached heights outside of Japan like Tekken would, attracting the casual audience with its design, aesthetics, and flashy moves. But it was always truly refining and perfecting its combat system in smart ways that make many people still argue that Virtua Fighter V is the best fighting game ever made. From a casual perspective of my own, VF5 is well worth playing, and if you like 3D fighting games, give it a shot someday if you have access to it. A PC port or a sequel would be great to have, although I'm sure we're going to be very busy for a while with the King of the Iron Fist over here, but Virtual Fighter deserves some love. Also, please make sure to use hashtag FightingVipers3. 
Because if I can imagine a Fighting Vipers 3 in the style of Virtual Fighter 5, oh god, that would be a show. Now you may be wondering, before we reach Tekken 6, what's going on with some of the weird Tekken spin-offs? What's going on with the PSP versions, and with the 3DS version, and with Death by Degrees? And I will be completely honest. My goal was to get this video out before Tekken 8, and well, now you know that I failed and that Tekken 8 is also a different video, but but why are these games absent from this retrospective? Well, they are complicated beasts in themselves. It's also a very strange thing. So I can tell you this, the PSP and the PS Vita versions of the games are almost identical. Tekken for the 3DS contains something like easy moves like you would see in more modern fighting games, something like Street Fighter 6 today. And Death by Degrees is strange as heck. And if you really want me to talk about Death by Degrees, if you want me to finish this game and make a video on it, I could talk about it for probably 40 to 50 minutes, maybe more. If you made it to this part of the video and you care, I want you to leave a comment in the comment section and just say, but what about Nina and that emoji face that looks like it's sadly crying. So instead of talking about that, we're going to transition directly from VF5 into the seventh generation of consoles, which is a really strange one with Tekken 6. And we're slowly entering an era right now where the seventh generation is far away enough to be strangely nostalgic, because Tekken 6 is indeed 15 years old, even if our memories or the numbers on the boxes might confuse us. And it's telling that in the first 15 years of Tekken, we had six Tekken games, and in the second 15 years, depending on how you want to count Tekken 6 releasing in 2009 and 8 releasing in 2024, we had either 3 or 4 or 2. Count it however you want. The point is, these games are old now, and budgets, costs, DLC, and updates would all very quickly change how things work. Much like a while ago, we had a revival of retro games emulating the 8 and 16-bit eras, we are now in an age where emulating the aesthetics and vibes of the 5th generation is popular, and slowly moving towards the 6th for its influences. And I can personally feel the nostalgia for the 7th creeping up on me, because time is strange and generations get longer. Tekken 6, as such, feels both old and new. It has a charm of the time in its side content, its innovation and its insanity, its aesthetics and its graphical fidelity. But it also feels like the clearest line straight into Tekken 7. Everything about the game has changed just enough that it's no longer Tekken 5. It's revitalizing and modernizing the origins of the franchise. It's a step forward. It's Tekken 4, but this time it's good. Tekken 6 isn't really the most beloved in the franchise though. Tekken 3, 5, and depending on who you ask, 7 are the real darlings, and being smack dab in the middle of time, Tekken 6 is also in the middle of reception these days. It's not bad, but it's not great. It's not old enough for people to treasure in nostalgia, but not recent enough to be shiny and modern. And I really like Tekken 6. That comparison to Tekken 4 is very apt in my opinion on many different levels. It brings in a whole host of important changes and new characters much like Tekken 4 did, but this time they kept the classics in, making those new ones and those new changes a little more palatable we could say, since there's always this feeling that new characters take the spots of favorites, so when they don't, we accept them more easily. And the gameplay is just the same, it once again adds a lot of stage stuff. And stages, there's a ton of stages, and they can have breakable walls and floors and they don't interfere with gameplay in unpredictable ways, so it's actually pretty great. It recalculates damage, but this time, instead of nerfing ground damage, it buffs damage to standing characters, keeping overall damage high. And that's great! Walls are important to combos, but the way combo scaling resets has been standardized with walls to reduce damage, which is also great! It does add Rage, a very contentious mechanic that increases character damage when they're low on HP, and this would show up in other games as well, and it's a whole thing, but hey, they tried something! And to accompany this insanity, they definitely went all out with the story. Specifically, the scenario campaign. This is the final form of Tekken Force, at least so far. Maybe it'll come back one day. But this new story mode, which is actually pretty great, 
I'll talk a bit more later, because it stars Lars Alexanderson and Alyssa Boskanovich. And that means I have a lot of story to cover first, so let's get into it. So this is interesting. Jin is now in charge of the Zaibatsu, but we need conflict, so where can we get conflict from? Well, Jin declares the Zaibatsu independent and declares war on the world's nations. World War T, if you will. And here enters Lars, who, big spoiler, is Heihachi's illegitimate son. But he doesn't know that yet. He's the leader of the Tekken Force field team at the moment, but he rebels against them. This doesn't stop him from getting knocked out and losing his memory from a G-Corporation attack. And remember, those are the eternal antagonists to the Mishima Zaibatsu. Kazuya is now the leader of G-Corp, by the way, and he puts a price on Jin's head, so Jin holds a new tournament to fight Kazuya. After the attack, Lars meets Alyssa Boskanovich, android daughter of Dr. Boskanovich. They team up to take down Jin, defeating plenty of people along the way and even finding allies in Li Chaolan, Raven, and Zafina, who is a new astrologist that studies ancient evils. And that's because it turns out Alyssa was just a mole sent to spy on Lars by Jin, who really started this war to bring out Azazel, an ancient demon, whom, if defeated, would cure him of the devil gene. But Azazel needs negative energies out and about to appear, which is why he did the whole world war thing. In the end, Lars has to take down Azazel, then Alyssa, and then Jin, but not really, because Jin and Azazel are fine, until Jin smacks Azazel and plummets into the sands. But then Raven picks Jin up from the sands, and Jin still has the devil mark, so dun dun dun. That was still lame the second time, why did I do it? Also, Lars gets Lee to repair Alyssa, and this is just the main plot. We have to talk about what happens to all the characters. So for newcomers, we have Bob Richards, which is an American martial arts genius that can't fight big opponents because he's very small. And so he decides to gain a ton of weight and strength while staying fast. And to test his new physique, he enters the tournament. We also have Emile de Rochefort, or Lily for short. She's the daughter of a pacifist oil tycoon that has issues with the Zaibatsu, and she joins to seek revenge slash resolution of these affairs, but ends up in a rivalry with Asuka Kazama, who wants to capture Jin. Leo Kleissen is a German fighter whose mom was taken out by Kazuya, so he joins to find out the truth from the Zaibatsu. Sergei Dragunov is a Spetsnaz soldier tasked with bringing down the Zaibatsu, specifically Jin. Miguel Caballero Rojo is a Spanish matador with a love for fighting and no discipline. And Miguel wants revenge on the Zaibatsu because they killed his sister during her wedding. Yoshimitsu discovers that his sword is losing power and will drive him insane unless it spills the blood of evildoers. He now has a new sword to accompany the usual sword, but he jumps into the tournament to spill some blood. Anna Williams is now fighting for Kazuya as Nina is fighting for Jin and acts as his right-hand woman during the story. Armor King 2 is Armor King 1's brother and the menace that was confusing King and Marduk in Tekken 5. Ganryu enters to promote the restaurant he's opened in Hawaii to make money, but he ends up donating all the money accidentally to Julia's reforestation campaign, which is ongoing now during Tekken 6 and will enter Tekken 7 to make that money back. Warang and Baik are here to compete since Warang wants to beat Jin still. Eddie Gordo is now a member of the Tekken Force and a high-ranking one at that. Lei Wulong is investigating the Zaibatsu or something related to it. I actually don't remember. These notes are confusing at this point. Steve Fox joins up to find out who he really is and what went on with the Mishima Zaibatsu, and Paul and Law, as I've said before, join because they need money. Also, there's stuff like Roger Jr. and Bruce, and just, there's, there's 40 characters in this game, okay? Anyways, Tekken 6 making Lars Alexanderson and Alyssa the main focus felt like yet another refresh, but keeping in the classics made accepting this easier, but both of them are great characters that really showcase some of the wackier things that always existed in the series. For me, one of the more interesting things to consider about the franchise is the legacy of its main characters, which according to the fanbase, and something I mostly agree with, these main characters tend to embody the spirit and philosophy of the game they're in. Kazuya in Tekken 1, Heihachi in 2, the iterations of Jin in the rest, with him being the refinement of the Mishima gameplay in 3, the transformation of the series in 4, the duality coming together in 5 with Jin and Devil Jin, but with 6, I really think that Lars is not just the main character in the story mode, but the one that really symbolizes Tekken 6 in its design and his playstyle. 
It's different, it's flashy and mobile and mix-up heavy, a little more dead or alive than before. It's trending towards a different direction, but not one I dislike. I did initially not like Tekken 6 much, nor Lars, but now I've come around because he's pretty damn cool, and so is this game. When we talk about the identity of Tekken, how it flows when you are fighting, Tekken 6 really marks a breaking point. And this is why so many people call it out as when the series went down the deep end for some. I think it's in the right direction, though. We have the introduction of bound moves, meaning that basic combos now want to start with a launcher, transition to a bound move, and finish with a normal combo. A lot of the roster has a lot of movement as well. Mix-ups and different attacks are all over the place, especially in new characters like Bob and Dragonov and Lily, and of course, Lars and Alyssa, who strongly incorporate movement and stances into their general gameplay, making a lot of the high level of Tekken gameplay, which is good movement, more accessible to people. Everything flows better, it plays faster, and yes, the juggle combos are still kind of just dialogue combos, you really have to know them in advance, but a lot of the general movement and hitting buttons feels more dynamic and flashy than ever before, and that's the direction that Tekken 6 would take the franchise in. It still retains all of the goofy elements, I mean, the main plot point is that Jin starts World War T. Seriously. But it also just tries to be wacky with a lot of the endings. Some of them are a little bit more canon-friendly, but most of them are just fun and silly. The scenario campaign is an incredibly ambitious idea, although it does make the mistake of locking the traditional arcade mode and playing through characters to get their endings behind scenario campaign, which you need to progress through in order to unlock characters for the classic arcade mode. But of course this is a different era, there's no longer unlockable characters, you just pop the game in and you can jump into super ghost battles or into online play. So I guess they wanted to flesh out that single player content by making you play through scenario campaign to then enjoy the arcade modes, which at this point you really would play just to get those endings. You play it for the story, because if you just wanted to practice with the character, that was the intention of the ghost battles or the treasure battles from 5. But playing through scenario campaign is really what Tekken Force should have been. This is the ultimate form of the mode. All of the stages are varied, they contain wacky cutscenes as you go through them. The combat system is just the normal combat system, but the third-person controls have now been streamlined by dividing them between the D-pad and the left analog stick. And while graphically it's not as impressive as I think the game is when fighting, it does hold up well enough and is an entertaining romp. It feels like a really big, complete package. It is also helped by the fact that it's just a new generation of Tekken for real this time, in the sense that this is the online generation. You pick it up to play against people on the internet. And a lot of the different ideas of how Tekken Online would work started here, because as much as Tekken 5 had that online version, it wasn't as complex or fleshed out as this one. The fact that its soundtrack is Probably the best in Tekken history, if we are averaging out great tracks, probably up there along with Tekken 3, it means I'm always pumped for battle. The general gameplay systems, all of the characters that are available, the stages, the graphics, the effects, everything for me in Tekken 6 comes together to make a great game. It is not as polished and robust as what we can play today within the franchise, but it doesn't deserve to be looked back on as a negative in the series. I think a lot of people hated the idea of Alyssa with the robot chainsaw arms and Lars being this protagonist that was kind of being shoved down our throats as, hey, it's another Mishima. But in retrospect, I think that they're both great characters and what they bring to the roster, and when you play modern Tekken, they still fit in very well and have their niche within them. Very unique playstyles that focus on other things, give accessibility to new players, but have tons of depth and complexity without overwhelming or overpowering the traditional methods and how they've been modernized. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that Tekken 6 might get a bad rap, but it doesn't deserve it. And what it also didn't deserve was the failure it was in sales. I don't know what to attribute this to. Maybe Tekken just didn't have the staying power. People didn't care 
for the characters as much anymore, or maybe it was just that 3D fighting games were on a negative trend, because at this point in time, in 2009, everybody was playing Street Fighter 4. Everybody was excited about fighting games again, but they weren't as excited about Tekken. It languished with around 3 million in sales, and it almost destroyed the entire franchise. The Tekken team would then refocus to make the most bombastic, biggest possible game to get fans into Tekken once again, to get those sales. And the project they decided to do it for was Tekken Tag Tournament 2. And once again, this one isn't canon, so I can talk about this release from just the gameplay side, and it's really fun, seriously. The roster here, despite being gated behind pre-orders and weird things at launch, is just massive. It brings back the tag mechanics with a ton of different additional things, as well as tweaks and changes to the characters. It even partnered up with Nintendo to add some costumes and locked Tekken Ball to the Wii U. Which is a crime, I say. A crime. Tekken Tag 2 was also the Tekken team's next failure in sales. Some might attribute the decline of Tekken to the rising popularity of 2D fighting games. But Tekken Tag 2's failure is a weird one to point out. I don't know if it's that the graphics weren't impressive, or that it was just overall not the best moment for fighting games in general, but the sales were so catastrophic that it caused Bandai Namco to cancel Tekken. Outright. I mean, spoilers, it comes back, but I really want to contextualize how sad it is, because I would find this logical if Tekken 6 and Tag 2 were bad games, but Tag 2 is in my top 3 games in the series. It plays beautifully, with just the right amount of insanity added into it, with things like aerial command grabs and juggle combos that take advantage of tags, as well as tag throws, but the damage isn't so high that touch of death combos are a thing, which is when if you get touched by a single attack they can lead to you just dying immediately. It's super rewarding to learn, with flashy combos galore and the huge roster of characters makes it a joy to explore and play around in. And that's really one of the most important parts of it for me. It feels playful. Sure, it has all the Tekken mechanics you expect, and then the tag ones on top of that, but everything from those mechanics to changes in movesets, the stages, the soundtrack, the insanity of the Snoop Dogg stage where he's rapping while you fight, it feels like the series is just having some honest-to-goodness fun, exploring its wackier side without restraint. And that just doesn't seem to jive with everyone though, which I can understand. The juxtaposition of the insanity of Tekken with how it plays so much of itself in a self-serious tone is really what sells the personality, and if you make it all wacky, it loses some of that. But Tekken Tag 2, in many ways, is better than Tekken 7, which I'm aware we haven't gotten to, but it feels closer to that transition point that Tekken 6 is, which is a specific game flow that I really like. There's a pacing to these games that is highly enjoyable, where even though you're still counting frame data and making sure what you can punish and what you can't and all those sorts of things, and you're aiming for your big moves to do your big combos, which still remain launcher into bound into hopefully a wall splat, in Tekken 7 it feels a lot more like you're playing chess to me, and I'm sure that's going to be something that people disagree with me on, but here things flow in an interesting way that just clicks with me, because it feels like a continuation of Tekken 6, and just with a lot more characters and a lot more stuff to do, including additional content, things like Tekken Bowl. It's lacking that main single player component that we had in Tekken 6, but What's on display is just such a wealth of content that it's hard to argue that you're getting so much bang for your buck, so much depth with all of the systems, because not only do you have this enormous roster, but you also have to keep in mind all of the different tag mechanics that are put onto this game, which very similarly to Tekken Tag Tournament 1, do prolong rounds and make them a little bit more strategic if you're a fan of that tag system. It's phenomenal, it's fun, and yeah, sure, maybe it's not for everyone, but it did end up with only 1.5 million sales. The largest flop the franchise had ever seen. And it took Harada and crew a long time to convince Bandai Namco that they should give Tekken one last, last shot for real this time. They really wanted to go out with a bang. They wanted to make Tekken 7. And even though the budget for Tekken 7 
wasn't stratospheric, they did indeed receive approval to do it. And Tekken 7 would be the game to change everything. So I have two potentially controversial takes on Tekken 7. It has the worst story and the best gameplay. Well, I guess that's just one take. Tekken 7, surprisingly, was not very successful on launch, both with critics and sales-wise, but it's a game that added new mechanics, pushed the gameplay forward, and very importantly, became popular over time, with players and with a flourishing competitive scene. While it was a relief that it didn't tank, Tekken 7 was still on a knife's edge, but the team embraced modern fighting games, especially things they'd see from the competition at NetherRealm Studios with Mortal Kombat. For starters, Akuma. Yes, the Akuma from Street Fighter would not only be a guest character, but be put into the Tekken lore. No doubt a relic from work on Tekken Cross Street Fighter, the cancelled Namco version of Street Fighter Cross Tekken, which we didn't cover in this retrospective because even though it contains Tekken, it's primarily a Capcom fighting game. Akuma would bring a lot of eyes on the game that would only continue with the introduction of other high-profile guest characters, as well as important seasonal updates that not only expanded the roster, but rebalanced them, added new mechanics and systems, and kept making the game better and better. But before we cover all of that, we need to talk about the story where Akuma is now canon. So, after the Jin and Azazel kerfuffle, the war between the Mishima Zaibatsu and the G Corporation rages on, and we get told a story using a narrative device that I and most people hate, which is that it's told from the perspective of a reporter covering the war. Jin is MIA, and Heihachi overpowers Nina Williams to take control over the Zaibatsu, and he hires newcomer Claudio Serafino, who's into religious stuff and is an anti-devil agent guy from a religious organization. But Claudio warns of an evil energy from the Far East, which is neither Jin nor Kazuya, and it is of course Akuma. Jin is on the run from the UN, but Lars saves Jin, which Lars is technically Jin's half-uncle, and they join up with Lee and Alyssa to hatch a plan to stop Kazuya. Lars reveals that Heihachi had him just to prove that he himself did not possess the devil gene, which allowed Heihachi to understand that it comes from his late wife, Kazumi Hachijo. And don't ask about Jinpachi because that's a different thing. Heihachi decides to confront his past deeds, explaining the feud with the Hachijos and how Kazumi had the devil gene. And when she tried to kill him, he killed her in self-defense. He reveals that his worry with Kazuya all the way back in Tekken 1 was surrounding the gene and its existence, and the war of the Hachijos and Mishimas. Kazuya is enraged, understandably, you know, from the lies and being a devil, and also his father trying to reveal that he's a devil to the world, and also trying to end him over and over. Also, Akuma made a deal with Kazumi to end Heihachi all the way back then, in case she wasn't capable of doing it. And the reason Akuma has waited this long is because he needed Heihachi to get stronger for it to be a fun fight. Because that's Akuma for you. In the end, Kazuya and Heihachi fight in the only place that would make sense. Inside a volcano. Kazuya wins, and this time, for real for real, no cap fam, Heihachi be dead. Then Kazuya fights Akuma, and we don't know who wins, but Kazuya doesn't die. And then Lars, Jin, Lee, and Alyssa are there, and they vow to end this war and this lineage by taking down Kazuya in Tekken 8. And that's for another video. Instead, let's talk about all the crazy characters in Tekken 7, including DLC, well, at least the new ones. We have Josie, a young kickboxer whose dream is to join the Tekken Force, Gigas, a giant red-skinned man with cybernetics, he's technically a weapon from a research institute and he's being tested in the tournament, Katarina is a Brazilian woman who practices Savate, and she's looking for her father, who is Gigas. Leroy Smith is a Wing Chun specialist from New York City seeking revenge on Heihachi due to some crime-related things that happened under the Mishima Zaibatsu's reign, I guess. Lydia Sobieska is the Prime Minister of Poland, and Heihachi threatens Poland, so she joins the tournament to defend Poland. Some of the stuff you just can't make up, dude. Lucky Chloe is an otaku cat girl mascot from G Corporation, and she's obviously inspired by Japanese idol culture. Also, Harada once joked on Twitter, since the fans had so much rejection towards Lucky Chloe that what they should have done 
is made Lucky Chloe exclusive to the Asian audiences and have put in some muscle-bound meathead as an exclusive character for the West. He then had to clarify that this was a joke because some media outlets thought it was real. Master Raven is the superior of Raven and also a much cooler design. Shaheen is a Saudi Arabian fighter and a security expert whose impeccable record of protecting his clients is broken in shady dealings with G Corp and Kazuya, so now he's after Kazuya. Fakum Ram is a Muay Thai legend who is enslaved and framed and now sent to fight in the war in exchange for the freedom of him and his family. Eliza is a vampire. She has connections to Claudio and Lily, and she's a narcoleptic and also just a, a vampire. For guest characters, we have Geese Howard from SNK fame, Akuma, obviously, Noctis from Final Fantasy XV, and of course, Negan Smith from popular fighting game, The Walking Dead. Look, if we can have Robocop in Mortal Kombat, Negan is fine by me. Everyone else is here, but with different stuff. A lot of characters just follow their natural paths, although it's worth mentioning that Nina is hired to assassinate Anna's husband during their wedding, where Steve Fox finds her and confronts her because this is Tekken. But the stories really take a back seat here. A lot of the arcade endings are as fun as you would expect and as they have always been, but since Tekken 6 really front-loaded that main story, giving you this big expansive storyline that follows with all these cutscenes, that is kind of put on the back burner since they really want people to be aware of the actual canon storyline of Tekken for some reason, and I think that reason is because it's actually awesome. And Tekken 7's legacy, along with all of these characters, would be a long one. From October 2015, at its launch, to January 2024, Tekken 7 would enjoy a long life with DLC, updates, and a wildly successful competitive tournament scene. Its initial release was decent, with sales reaching 2 million within 2 months. But after 9 years, it is now the best-selling Tekken game ever, with over 10 million sales surpassing Tekken 3. And that is because, while not the highest budget game as I said before, and it is uneven in the quality of characters as time went on, it's really apparent now, because if you play Tekken 8, and Tekken 7, you can tell that those last waves of DLC characters already play very close to what Tekken 8 plays like, and the base roster is kind of a little bit more rigid. But even with that, Tekken 7 is superb. It plays like a dream. It's fast and fun and responsive. It introduces things like Rage Arts, which are a super that you can use during Rage Mode, which is when you're really low on health. It also brings in Power Crushes, which are Hyper Armor moves. And it also brings in Screw Hits, which is a different name for the Bound moves that we had before. And now they're called Tornado moves in Tekken 8. Uh, I think Tornado is uh, fine. We should just leave it there at Tatsumaki's, I guess. But overall, it plays like Tekken 6, but better. It is a refinement of the ideas brought forth in Tekken 6. But not really that revolutionary, just the things that needed to be done have been done. And they're brought here with the same attention that you would expect. So you have the big story mode, you have a ton of customization, you got Tekken Bowl, or well, technically Ultimate, the King of Iron Fist Bowl, uh, thanks to Season 1 DLC, and of course the evolution of the online system. Tekken 7 just kept on going. Its gameplay is that refinement that people wanted from Tekken 6, and since most people didn't play Tekken Tag Tournament 2, I guess they didn't enjoy it there. But this is one step further. And it's graphically impressive. It has all the guest characters to get all the articles to be written about it. And it had all of the tournaments that a modern fighting game needs to really be popular in the FGC. It's truly spectacular how content-filled this game is. Especially how much support it received through the four season passes. And sure, we can argue that those cost money, so the base game wasn't that feature-packed, but I mean it was, it had 37 characters at launch with only Eliza locked behind the pre-order. It's just that now, after all of that DLC support, it looks ridiculous with how many characters it has and how much more depth is added to each one compared to Tekken 6. Although, that also kind of pales in comparison to all of the changes that Tekken 8 has made now. But. I'm not going to talk about Tekken 8 in this video. I'm going to say that Tekken 8 is 
absolutely incredible. And and while this video did slip out of my deadline and Tekken 8 is out, I did take the opportunity to play some Tekken 8 and that delayed this video further because I accidentally played it for 35 hours because it's just that good and I have a lot of things to say about Tekken 8. But being that it's a brand new game, I'm just going to put some random footage of it up here and say that it's amazing and you should go play Tekken 8. But I don't want to spoil the story. I think that if you've never played a Tekken game before and you got all the way to this part of this video, you're really going to appreciate the story in Tekken 8 and you're probably going to love playing it. I think it's the most accessible Tekken has ever been, at least for actual competitive gaming. But it's also incredibly deep and very complicated if you're looking for that depth. So it's a great starting point. It's also an absolutely gorgeous looking game. So if you're into pretty graphics, uh, it's also well worth it. And Tekken 8, just to make this video feel a little bit more complete, in the gameplay department does add heat, which is a mechanic that lets you transition into a powered up state where a lot of move properties change and you get access to a heat finisher. And it also adds recoverable health by adding things like chip damage on certain moves and during heat which you can then recover in different ways through a round and i think all the changes are really smart and incredibly fun but i will have a dedicated video just to analyzing the story of tekken 8 and how the legacy of tekken feels so complete and there's a lot to say about why tekken 8 is amazing but i'm not gonna do that here and now what i will say is that it's rare that a franchise, in its entirety, is this special. For something that really had that it factor, a magic that captured the hearts of millions in the 90s, to then a fall from grace as fighting games revived, a rise from the ashes. And these are themes that are even present in Tekken 8's story, because the team is well aware that Tekken has withstood everything to really show that this special corner of the fighting game community stands strong with a passion only matched by the fires of volcanoes. They are beautiful games and beautiful pieces of history, surrounded by their peers and the culture that came with them. They represent a culture within gaming that breathes dedication and perseverance and exhales in relief at the thought of what they still love still being successful and hopefully now more than ever. And that legacy, the legacy of Tekken, will be felt forever, because you can't see two characters sidestepping and punching each other without thinking about Tekken, and I don't think we ever will. It might not have been the first, but it always was and still stands as the reigning champion in many hearts, from wild triumphs to bittersweet defeats. It stood again and again to take on any contenders in any weather, and has come out victorious, and I wouldn't have it any other way. There is nothing more poetic than a fighting game series that continues to champion the idea of getting back up after you're down, getting back up after they were down, and absolutely hitting it out of the park. I love Tekken. I hope you do too, and I hope you enjoyed this video, which was indeed a lot of work. So, I'm Mukthi. I enjoyed making this more than I care to admit, and I want to make more. So, let me know what you think about it in the comments below. But for those of you who made it all the way to the end, I do have two things to ask of you. First, if you're going to leave that comment, sneak in the word excellent in it. That lets me know that you got all the way to the end of the video, and I'll heart every comment that includes it. And second, I have decided to launch a Patreon. It's not required, which is why I won't really publicize it. The only reason I've made it is for those of you who wish to support me to be able to do so. And thanks to the fact that my current job is freelance, all the support I might receive will directly translate to me switching my day job hours for time to make more and better videos, which is my dream. I don't need this support to live or anything like that and I don't want anyone to click on the link if you don't have money to spare. But as I keep pursuing my dream of making great videos for everyone to enjoy, know that it'll help in making that something I can realistically do all of the time instead of just during my free time. 
If you're interested, that link is in the description, but after the jump, again, I don't want people to think that I'm out here begging for money. The fact that you watched this video and made it to the end is more than enough support, trust me. And I hope I'm making that clear. And I will keep making videos, no matter what. So, if you want to watch them, they will be here. Uh, but it would help if you subscribe, if you haven't done that yet. I want to thank absolutely everyone, from the bottom of my heart, for their support. This was a really big project, and I'm happy I could get it done. It was truly massive, and I learned a lot making it that I plan to incorporate into my future videos and making them better. But it means so much to me that I can make this video and that you're watching it. So as always, stay clear volcanoes, and I will see you again very soon.